And here we are. The fate of the planet is in the hands of a bunch of that I wouldn't trust with a potato gun. So once upon a time, there was a company called BioWare that liked space, but they didn't like Discount Film Santa dictating what they could and couldn't do with space, so they made their own space. And eventually, Mass Effect was born. Mass Effect was released in 2007 for the Xbox 360, and later for the PS3 and PC. You played as Commander Shepard, prominent Alliance military figure and lover of all things capitalist as you try to apprehend galactic criminal Saren. It was a stupid good hit and paved the way for sci-fi and world building as we know it today. In fact, it was so stupid good it had two sequels, two mobile games, and a fourth game that exists. Eh. But what happened before Mass Effect 1, some may wonder. Well, look at that, there's a book. Mass Effect Revelation is the official prequel novel to the Mass Effect series of games. It was published by Delray Ballantine Books and penned by Drew Carpishin, lead writer of Mass Effect 1 and 2. With that in mind, it would seem comforting to know that one of the minds behind the games is responsible for the book in question. But just how much does the book contribute to Mass Effect's lore? Does it add a considerable amount to the game's backstory, or is it just a nice light read? Is it even good? That is an alien. The book weighs in at a solid 323 pages in mass market paperback form. Revelation was released in May of 2007, about six months before the first game was. The story of the book overall follows David Anderson, a lion soldier and Keith David, as he attempts to unravel a conspiracy involving scientist Kaylee Sanders. But what the fuck is the Alliance? Well, if you never played Mass Effect, here's a brief overview. In the future, we as humans banded together after discovering some cool alien shit on Mars. The humans allied their systems together and called themselves the Systems Alliance. Then eventually, we discovered a big ol' space gun floating around Pluto called a Mass Relay. It's one of a series of big ol' space guns that shoot you to a different predetermined point in the galaxy using FTL and science bullshit. So later in 2157, we find aliens. War breaks out, shit happens, and suddenly we got thick extraterrestrial honeys all on our dick. Oh hell yeah! The book as a whole takes place in 2165 and follows David Anderson as his career starts and a bit into it. In the games, he's a captain and a mentor slash almost father figure to the protagonist, Shepard. But here he is just a sweet baby boy. I won't go hefty into spoilers in this part, but overall the book is a pretty fine read. A brief overview. An attack at an Alliance research station prompts an investigation that leads to a deeper conspiracy. Throughout the book is some well-paced action and smart, clever dialogue between characters. There's not many things that stick out as out of place or abstractly weird, even in a setting of extraterrestrials and alien cultures, it all works together and makes sense and feels natural. There's one or two things here and there that seem weird, and the pacing does get broken up every now and again, but it doesn't majorly detract from the book. Let's look at four of the major players here who show up in the games or are decently prominent in some way. Dave Id Anders, man. He's our protagonist for the novel, loyal soldier, and recent divorcee. Poor guy went so hard as a soldier and was away for so long that his wife Cynthia left him. Poor one out. Other than that though, his characterization in the book comes to line up perfectly with the game. In fact, in Mass Effect 1, he tells you a bit about this incident in his own words. About 20 years ago, I was part of a mission in the Skillian Verge. I was working with Saren to find and remove a known terrorist threat. Saren eliminated his target, but a lot of people died along the way, innocent people. And the official records just covered it all up. From top to bottom, he shows growth and resolve and lives up to his reputation of badass that he gets from the game and from other lore. Like, listen to this shit that he throws out in the middle of the book. When you hear about someone for so long, you assume you know something about them, Anderson said in a more somber tone. It's easy to confuse the reputation with the real person. It's only when you meet them that you realize you never really knew anything at all. It's a good line that sums up how his feelings have developed over the course of his career and you feel for him as a result. Next up, say er in Ah, good old Saren, who here is less of a direct antagonist than in the 2007 game itself. Holy shit, this game came out 13 years ago? What the fuck? Saren is what's known as a Spectre, essentially a space special ops cop that has very few restrictions. Spectres operate under the Council, who oversee the politics in the Milky Way galaxy. Saren acts evil and does evil things and says evil shit, but more or less, he's not actively trying to counter Anderson for the majority of the book. He's got his own agenda and sees Anderson more as a mere obstacle than a force against his own to bout with. As a result, it's not a directly confrontational antagonist, just 
Saren being a cunt. Perhaps that's just his bias against humans at play, but overall he's a bad motherfucker that seeks to fulfill his own desires. The book does give a slight bit more insight into Saren than in the game, and he has some absolutely chilling lines from him that build him up to be just downright heartless. I have two rules I follow, Saren explained. The first is, never kill someone without a reason. And the second? Anderson asked, suspicious. You can always find a reason to kill someone. That's just fucking relentless. Christ on a stepladder. And then we got Kay Lee's and Doors, aka the fucking center of this novel. She's kind of a tough bitch, not sexualized, thankfully, and smart. Her major flaw is that she's stubborn and selfless to a fault. She's sharp as a whip and very observant. Quick no-spoiler context, she's getting detained by alleged Alliance military police. She takes note of the gun on his hip, a pistol called the Striker, which leads to... Her mind screamed out a warning even as she felt the cuff slap on her right wrist. The Hanukkah RP-7 was the standard issue pistol for all Alliance personnel, not the Striker. Nice. She's also the reason behind the whole inciting incident. Thanks, Thanks bitch. bitch. She only appears once in the games, voiced by Great Lyle during a side mission in Mass Effect 3. Anderson talks a bit about her, thankful that she's okay. And then we've got motherfucking John Grissom, American hero. Let's a fucking go! He doesn't show up in the games because he doesn't need to. Oh, fucking legend here! Okay, for real. John Grissom is an Alliance war hero and a living legend who was one of the first bad boys to go through the mass relay that the humans first discovered. He's old, gritty, and a cynical bastard jaded by politics, paparazzi, and his past. I love him, and he's got a lot of great quotes strewn in that make him an interesting and exceptional side character. What I think sums up his character the best isn't his actions or his words, but how he keeps his house. On the subject of finding food in Grissom's fridge. They found some bread, cold cuts, and mustard in his fridge, along with 36 cans of beer. What a Fucking shit, old man, I love him. These are our four main focal characters. Everyone else more or less shows up once and then disappears forever. Which sucks, because there's a few interesting characters that show up and you start nodding your head because what they're saying is interesting and cool and they have a good personality. And then three chapters later you realize, oh fuck, they were made just to move the plot along and then disappear with no major arc or scenes. Rip them. The rest of the book, for the most part though, is all pretty good. It's an entertaining read from top to bottom with great action, great dialogue, and it's an interesting interesting lead-in to Mass Effect 1. Drew Carpishan was able to build a lot of intrigue, a whole universe, while telling a simply a compelling tale. Hell, he even talks about a whole race and tells you something that isn't even shown until the second fucking game! Or well, DLC if you bought it, but I don't remember people really talking about bring down the sky. Batarians, motherfucker! While well, they were still in beta. And you learn that apparently they have the best medical technology in the whole galaxy? I, I honestly don't think that this ever appears in any of the three games, and not even Andromeda. Correct me if I'm wrong. Batarians were on the cutting edge of medical science, and the standard of care at their facilities was among the best in Citadel space. As much as I looked this up, I cannot find any other reference to this in any other piece of Mass Effect media. Was the idea just nixed? Was this honestly that unimportant that it didn't need to be included? I honestly feel like in parts of the series you could do a lot with just this alone. Side quests, interesting NPCs, things like that. Granted, Batarians are kind of a straw man antagonistic species towards humans, and granted, more Batarians are kind of slavers and usually the fodder for various gangs that you fight and overall negatively portrayed in their appearances, but still, the writers at Bioware are smart and they could easily have done something here. Other than that, the book was a good way to prelude and hype up the upcoming game, especially with the universe as expansive and diverse as it is. It's brilliant how they use Saren on the front cover, because he looks both intriguing and menacing at the same time, and draws you in and gets you to ask, who's this motherfucker? This cover is also the least busy of the trilogy released. Yes, there's only three books that happen in the Milky Way galaxy, a fourth does not exist at all. These covers love to remind you that these novels are thrilling and from Bioware. Anyway, back to Revelais. Throughout the book, Drew Carpishan throws out a lot of engaging scenarios and action sequences that keep you in and they feel organic and natural. It's not overly complicated and it reads easy. The action towards the start of the novel thankfully serves to show Anderson's skill and his experience at play, as well as how close-knit his team is due to their training and his leadership. Alliance soldiers trusted their teammates, and they trusted their leader. He figured that would give them the edge they needed over any band of mercs. Again and again, they repeated the process. 
Anderson sending one person on the move while the others lay down covering fire to keep the enemy on the defensive. He varied who would go each time. The key was to keep the team moving and keep their opponents off balance. There's also great moments that stay extremely relatable. For example, Anderson and his squad are on a mission when they come across a room with a bunch of dead scientists. F in the chat for my boys. But even more, those dead bodies are rigged to explode with bombs. F in the chat for my boys. Anderson, thinking on his feet, weighs the option of having the tech expert disarm them quickly or bolting. After a single moment of self-deliberation, he very simply yells at everybody to run. <laughs> Love Anderson, what a dilf. But what in the fuck actually happens in the noble? <laughs> well, sit back and I'll tell you, but be warned, we're gonna delve into spoilers. Lots and lots of spoilers. What's a better place to start jumping around in a book and talk about it other than the start? Our story begins eight years before we focus on Anderson. We start the prologue with exposition and focus on John Grissom. The book has an intriguing hook that gets you sunk in with no problem and brings up countless exciting questions. Approaching Arcturus. Disengaging FTL Drive Corps. Rear Admiral John Grissom of the Alliance, the most famous man on Earth and its three fledgling interstellar colonies, glanced up briefly as the voice of the SSV New Delhi's helmsman came over the shipboard intercom. Most famous man on Earth? The FTL? Three colonies? Tell me fucking more, that's interesting, I want to read! Hell, I can't read. And read we do. We get some more exposition. The prologue ends in a super good fucking quote of John Grissom and Anderson together. Think about your wife. Are you willing to risk her life for the sake of freedom? I don't know, sir, was Anderson's solemn reply. Are you willing to condemn your daughter to the life of a slave? That's the answer I was looking for. Then eight years pass and we begin our story. The plot starts with an Alliance research facility getting fucking assaulted. It happens on a planet called Sidon where a bunch of mercs came in and blew up the place after murdering pretty much everyone. And who else is connected to this whole thing than our girl Kaylee Sanders? Oh, you. Who we soon learn, by the way, that she's John Grissom's daughter, whoops. Anyway, it turns out the facility was dabbling with AI, which is mega illegal. And she is the only known survivor who, in the eyes of the Alliance, went AWOL. So Anderson gets asked very politely by the Alliance to go get the bitch. But Saren also wants to go get the bitch. But the people who hired the mercs that are responsible for Sidon also want to go get the bitch. Everyone wants the bitch. You bitch! Except it turns out, she's not a bitch. The whole conspiracy is at the head of the research facility, a guy named Dr. Shu Kin was the real one responsible. You learn the truth later in Chapter 16, when after Kaylee finally trusts Anderson, she confesses everything. He takes it rough though, cause he kinda wanted to hit it. And I oop. The divorce must have hit him harder than he had realized. He had been so desperate and lonely that he had imagined some special connection between him and Sanders, when all they really had in common was a connection to an attack on an Alliance base. Sacrificing everything to be a better soldier had cost him his marriage. Now that his divorce was final, he had let his personal feelings interfere with a military assignment. Cynthia would have laughed at the irony. Fuck, that's a mouthful. Dr. Trader MD did this because he found some neat tech that he got obsessed with and oh, shit no. went to hell. Now if you played the games, hint hint, because it's not just obsession, and the tech isn't your grandma's fucking pocket watch especially when you later learn that it's called Sovereign. Hint. Fucking hint. Uh, anyway, soon after, Kaylee gets captured, and then Anderson is forced to team up with Saren and rescue her. The Council wants to make Anderson a Spectre, and they use the rescue op as the trial run. It doesn't go well, of course, and he doesn't make the cut, but in the end, all's well as Kaylee is found innocent <coughs> in Gucci. So that's the whole story in a nutshell, and lit it throughout are a lot of intriguing moments. Things like, Saren ruthlessly murdering a Batarian woman in her hospital bed for information. Her name was Jella, and she was involved in an attack relating to the mercs responsible for Sidon. She was so injured she was on tubal life support. So Saren pulls it out and pretty much went, Speak, you're dead anyway, lol. So she tells him who done it, and Saren learns a piece of information about the Sidon conspiracy. She dies. Of course. A doctor rushes in and is like, Yo, what the fuck? And Saren's just like, You were right. Saren told him, his voice showing no hint of emotion. Jella was too weak. She didn't make it. It goes to show that Saren is so hyper-focused on his tasks that he'll do anything and discard anyone who isn't worth it after using them. It's perfectly in line with his personality in the games as well. Speaking of which, the book also demonstrates how his attitude shifted from being a hardcore yet damned good specter to 
why he does what he does in the game. I'll save the finer details for you to read on your own, but the epilogue has two good quotes that really hammer it home. He had spent his entire life preparing for a moment like this. Everything he had ever done, his military service, his career with the Spectres, was only a prelude to this revelation. Now he had found his true purpose. Destiny had led him here. And Sovereign was the key to it all. It makes you realize that the book isn't just Anderson's prologue. It's also Saren's. Saren's level of passion or devotion to his service pales in comparison to the fixation that he gets for Sovereign. His writing is intriguing, engrossing, and smart as hell from both the book here and the first game. It separates him from being your average sci-fi villain and makes him into an understandable antagonist. You don't have to agree with him, but you can get him. And it's what makes Saren so memorable as a character and the perfect foray into the majesty of the universe of Mass Effect. Which is why this next part is going to be uneasy to talk about. The most oppressed group of all, gamers. Allow me to present the full context for the scene and we'll sit together and discuss just how the fuck this aged so poorly. Chapter 13. Kaylee and Anderson have made it to John Grissom's house, and they are held up with him there. The only apparent and feasible way to leave is through an alliance checkpoint. Kaylee Sanders is wanted as all hell, so if she's caught, everything's fucked. However, John Grissom has a solution. In his service, he's picked up a bunch of favors and contacts, as you do being a man of John Grissom's stature. Despite their estrangement, he loves his daughter and would do anything for her. So he calls a professional in to alter her appearance and her credentials to get her past the checkpoint. So far, so normal. The professional gets in and starts tending to Kaylee. Of course, Anderson begins to show signs of jealousy because he wanted to hit it and the professional's being delicate, changing her hairstyle and her eye color and her skin color and her clothes. Wait, what? The professional digitally altered the existing photo on Kaylee's ID, darkening and shortening her hair changing the color of her eyes and deepening the pigments of her skin. Then, he had her pop a handful of pigment pills. By the time he was finished with her hair, Kaylee's skin had become almost as dark as Anderson's. Her skin became as dark as Anderson's. I know I'm not the most expert person to talk about race, considering that I'm whiter than Scott the Waz, hey but I do think it's entirely agreeable that this sits kind of uncomfortably. And I know what you're thinking, but no, I do not think that this is racially charged at all. Let's look at both sides of the coin. On the one hand, race is only very briefly mentioned in the book. Towards the start of the book, page 15, the exposition mentions that a good chunk of humans have mixed racial characteristics. Sort of becomes an outdated concept is pretty much the gist of what's said. It's certainly helped by the idea that aliens exist. Race amongst humans is never mentioned in games or in the book as a means of judgment or prejudice. Hell, it's barely mentioned at all. Instead, the focus shifted, of course, to a species-based prejudice. It feels like Drew Carpitian wanted to make a subtle statement about how racism was effectively eliminated due to both the alliance forming and extraterrestrial activity, saying that the us versus them mentality shifted from a local mindset to a galactic mindset and that this scene shouldn't and isn't supposed to hold any racial weight because it's solely used as a means to advance the plot. And there's nothing else in the scene that's inherently offensive about it, like her fake name is Suzanne Weathers, it's just a generic catch-all kind of name. Now on the other hand, You're making a character Rachel Dolezal herself! What the fuck?! There are plenty, plenty, plenty other ways to do this! I read this scene and... I did a double take. This is the Mass Effect universe. Invisibility exists, or holographic disguises, or maybe you can make some total recall shit. The possibilities are really out there in terms of plot advancement and world building. Why set up this situation for this particular scenario in the first place? This route as a whole seems really misguided, I'd say. Personally, I think I get what Drew Carpitian was going for here, but it hasn't aged particularly well. Especially with today's social climate, seeing something like this just hits a little different than what he was going for. I reached out to Drew Carpitian for a general interview, hoping to ask him about this scene as well, but unfortunately he's not available and couldn't comment. Again, I don't think Drew Carpitian meant anything bad by this, 
From everything we know about the guy, he just seems like a super upstanding Canadian dude. It's just unfortunate how this one scene detracts from the rest of the book. As far as the rest of the book, it's all amazing, except for this one scene that just makes you stop. There's a point where you have to acknowledge that just because a statement can be made doesn't mean you have to make it in such a heavy-handed, prone-to-age-like milk way. This book came out in 2007. I'm fairly certain if my dumb babby brain read this in 2007, even then I'd be like, wait a minute, you can't make a white lady black, that's wrong. Well, I definitely am not white. I, I, nothing about being white describes who I am. I acknowledge I'm, yes. I was biologically born white to a white parent. You see what I mean? Hi, Herbert. So, at the end of it all, this book is a fantastic prequel to Mass Effect 1. It has a healthy dose of action and intrigue to keep you engrossed from start to end. The world building is excellent, and the pacing of the story isn't too fast or slow except for some parts, but it doesn't really detract too hard from the quality of the book. I finished reading it in about three days, so it's not that long of a read either. If you really tried, you could probably finish it in a day. As far as if the book is canon, it's 100% canon and lore-friendly because, for one, it's written by the lead writer of the first two games. As well as that, the books themselves appear as an easter egg in-game, Anderson talks about these events, and Kaylee appears in the third game. There's just more I wish would have come from this book. The Batarian example, for one. But what we got was pretty good, so I can't fault anyone. Even if a scene in this didn't exactly hold up to today's standards, if you can move past that, then it's a good read. If not, I can't say I blame you. This book would go on to have two sequels, and a fourth book does not exist whatsoever. Nope, nuh -uh, what are you talking about? Fuck you, that isn't real. What about Mr. Carpitian? Well, after Bioware was bought by EA, he panned Ascension and Retribution and then peaced out. He would leave after writing Mass Effect 2 and wanting to pursue other projects before coming back to Bioware briefly to get involved with the older public, and then leaving again. Hey, that's his life, man. He's currently working on some tabletop stuff last I checked and has a few things up his sleeve that I personally can't wait to see what's in store. I bought Revelation from Amazon, but it should also be available on Barnes & Noble or maybe your local half-price books. I've put links below if you want to buy it physically or digitally, as well as links to Mr. Carpition's website so you can check out all the other stuff he wrote, which I recommend. His writing style is pretty entertaining. I give Mass Effect Revelation a solid B- in terms of overall quality. I suggest giving it a read if you're a Mass Effect fan or looking for an entertaining military sci-fi experience. It goes to show that, perhaps in the end, even if everything else is top-notch and expansively fleshed out, then even a small misstep can bring an excellent piece of work down.